Managing a complex migratory resource requires information on when and where the species spends its time, how they may move around the landscape, what paths they take to do these things, and how good they actually are at staying alive and reproducing. Banding is a key tool for bird research and management to help answer these questions, not only in North America, but worldwide. Banding is specifically important to waterfowl and has driven management, actions, and decisions since its inception. Banding in its current form is accomplished through capturing birds through multiple means, which we'll get to a little bit later, and marking those, those birds with a numbered metal band, ultimately releasing them back into the wild and into the population. Information is collected on the bird during captures such as age, sex, and other metrics and reported with the band numbers to a governing body, the Bird Banding Lab. To complete the banding cycle or the data cycle as it were, birds may be recaptured in the future by biologists, they might be found dead by the general public, or even observed alive by birders and photographers. In the case of waterfowl and other game species, the birds may be harvested and the bands then reported to the Bird Banding Lab by hunters. Today, we leg band about 350,000 waterfowl every year, and about 85,000 are rec recovered and reported every year. And so that makes up not just the birds that were banded within that year, but obviously years prior. So banding really began before we had proper techniques or even knew what we wanted to do with the data. Early naturalists would mark birds with dyes and paints. They might glue thin metal discs to the feathers, and some of them even tied parchment papers to birds' legs with their banding information on them. Obviously, these methods were too crude to produce any important results, but it did get us a start in banding at least. The first recognized band was King Louis IV's Peregrine Falcon banded in 1595. And looking at this timeline, you might recognize some other names on here as well. Uh, John James Audubon, important figure in uh, ornithology in North America. And Jack Miner, who's actually accredited with the first complete record, so a banded bird that, was, that he banded and was subsequently harvested and reported later. So that's the first complete record on uh, the continent of North America. As biologists and naturalists began to see the utility in banding data, the American Bird Banding Association was formed in 1910. This was the predecessor to what we know now as the Bird Banding Lab and was the first real step in any organization of banding efforts across the U.S. The association got the ball rolling, but there was still no real direct guidance or objective with the banding effort. Frederick Lincoln was charged in 1920 with organizing the data by the U.S. Biological Survey, the organization that eventually became the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So in that year, he began banding oversight, essentially making banding data useful data. He kept records, began supplying bands, and managing permits. So the banding effort began to take a little bit more organized shape, and in that time began to look a little bit more like it does today. Frederick Lincoln is the reason for that, and he's credited with several landmark findings using early banding data. Probably the most important is the establishment of migratory flyways. Using banding reports, Frederick noted the path from the breeding grounds up north to the wintering grounds down south. He also noted that the birds stayed within a specific range or area, and he called that area the flyway. Here's an example of what those flyways currently look like, thanks all due to the data compilation and analysis by Frederick Lincoln. Starting from the west coast moving east, the Pacific Flyway, the Central Flyway, the Mississippi Flyway, and the Atlantic Flyway. So what's important to know about the flyways are that biologists from each flyway um, so every state is usually representative, every province and lots of other organizations meet about twice a year to talk about managing the populations of waterfowl and other water birds within that flyway. So they talk about the research that's going on, they talk about um, 
the harvest that actually happened during hunting season, and they set regulations and make decisions on how that population is going to be managed for the next year. So let's get to the fun stuff and uh, how we actually band birds. Biologists will submit a banding resume and a request from the bird banding lab for a permit and assuming that they have all their ducks in a row, uh, no pun intended, then they'll be approved and they can go on with their work. Their multiple trapping platforms are used for various types of bird species and I'll go through a few of those here and explain the, the application. Now what you want to keep in mind is with the with most trapping the idea is to get the birds coming to a bait or a lure um, get them acclimated to the to the trap usually it's open and they can kind of come and go with these as they please and then set the trap around them. So here's an example of a swim in trap and a walk in trap will be the same idea just in shower spots but you have an established bait pile um, you put this trap out there's a funnel here um, and you kind of leave it open at that funnel and leave this trap door open and get them used to coming to this. And when you want to set the trap, you close this funnel down to the water's edge. And so uh, these ducks will dive down in to get to the corn that's actually in the trap. And this trap door will be shut when it's set. And hopefully you'll come and it'll look like this whenever you approach the trap again. Rocket netting is another very common form of trapping for waterfowl. Um, and so very similar, established bait pile, birds coming to it, you stretch the net out and you get ready to um, fire off this rocket or these three rockets. And I figure I can show you better than I can tell you. So here's a short video of how that plays out. There's certainly other methods that we use to trap waterfowl. Those are just two of the most common. A couple of those other methods include confusion traps, which we've used a lot here for mallards and for wood ducks. We just finished up a wood duck project in uh, central Illinois using confusion traps for the captures. Um, there's also night lighting of birds, and here's a good picture of night lighting from an airboat, basically riding around all night with spotlights in an airboat trying to catch birds with a dip net. Um, and there's uh, audio lures used for walk-in traps for rails and other species and mist netting. There's, there's as many trapping platforms that you, you can dream up. If it works, biologists will probably use it as long as it's safe for the birds and safe for the people trapping the birds. A great thing about birds is that they come in all shapes and sizes, and so it's appropriate that their bands do also. And you see from this picture just how wide of a range of sizes that we're talking about, from as small as hummingbirds to as large as eagles or hawks. But what else is important? So obviously the attachment clamp type is an important consideration, and so for a lot of birds like ducks and songbirds and rails, we use butt end type bands, which basically just means that the band wraps around the leg of the bird and each end of the band comes to connect on the other side. Uh, Lock-ons or riveted bands are for larger birds like hawks, owls, and eagles that might pick away with their beak and try to remove the bands. Metal type, metal type is also an important consideration with aluminum being the most common, but for birds that spend a large portion of their time in brackish or salt waters, like lesser scalp or canvas backs or rails, it's important for them to have a non-corrosive material or something that's not going to eat away over time in those um, environments, and so we use ink alloy bands for those. And here's an example of just why we need to use those ink alloy bands. You can see just how worn the aluminum gets within, you know, sometimes just a year or two. Researchers often use auxiliary markers along with standard leg bands. These allow birds to be identified from afar or located from afar without capturing or otherwise disturbing the bird. Auxiliary markers can be placed on a bird's bill, feet, legs, neck, back, or even internally planted, implanted in the case of some transmitters. Neck collars and even large tarsus bands are colored and numbered and can be used to identify larger birds like geese 
from a distance using binoculars and spotting scopes. Net collars have played a large role in delineating goose and swan populations, determining their movements and distribution, and estimating survival and population size. There are other auxiliary markers out there like nasal saddles or web tags, um, but for the sake of time, we won't go into those here. Um, it's important, however, to know that there are many, many different ways to mark birds um, to observe in the future for data collection. And finally, wrapping up the actual banding portion of this discussion is the always fun release. This is the favorite among bi biologists and volunteers alike because it's always fun to turn these birds loose and think about where they may end up. Hopefully in a year, maybe two, maybe five, that data will be returned by some happy hunter, some birder, or some other observer that just happened upon the bird that's sporting the band. So before we finish here, it's important to note just how someone might report a band. As we discussed earlier, bands may be reported by any number of finders. Banders may recapture a bird that has a band on it from a previous study. Birders may observe them or photographers. As long as they have a clear picture of the band number or even in one of those auxiliary markers that we talked about. If it's a game species, it might be, hunter, it might be harvested by a hunter and the hunter has the band in hand and then can easily report that. No matter the method, the data cycle depends on reporting of the bands to the bird banding lab at their website, and that website is uh, here on your screen. Typically, the bird banding lab will give the reporter information on the bird, such as age, sex, where the bird was banded, and who actually the original bander was. They'll also email the reporter information, this same information on, on a certificate in appreciation for your report. We hope this video on the banding process has been informative and we appreciate you listening in. If you're interested in more information, I invite you to visit the Bird Banding Lab website where you can learn the ins and outs in, in more detail. You might also be interested in following our banding and other research in the Illinois River Valley at the Forbes Biological Station. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram with a quick search, and our website is www.bellrose.org. If you direct message us through one of the social media apps, or if you can find our emails on the website, feel free to ask any questions that you might have.